and was the first transmitter of Pioneer Station KFI in Los Angeles. Its power was 50 watts. It broadcast two hours each day. This is a crystal set, the Model T of radio. You dialed your program by jiggling a piece of fine wire that had to catch precisely the right spot on the crystal. That little wire. Oh, yes, remember? It was called a cat whisker. All that was 40 years ago. Today, millions of people all over America have accepted these familiar words as a way of life. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. From Cat Whisker to Peacock. An affectionate salute to the National Broadcasting Company in recognition of its 40 years of service to the nation. Good evening, I'm Chad Huntley. For the next hour, we're going to take a nostalgic look at and listen to some of the highlights of NBC's service to America over the past 40 years. For those of you who are over 40, much of our program will bring back pleasant memories. For those of you under 40, well, this is your chance to see and hear some of the great stars and shows that amused, entertained, and informed mom and dad when they were under 40. And what a fantastic 40 years this has been. We've experienced the worst depression in our history. The most costly war in history. We've witnessed the birth of the atomic age, the electronic age, the phenomenal growth of the automobile age, and the age of aviation. And we've watched in wonder the birth of the space age. We've seen the beginnings of possibly the most serious threat of all to the survival of the race, the population explosion, and an equally threatening problem, the pollution of the air we breathe and the water we drink. Yet we've also seen the lifespan of a normal human being increased by more than 15 years. We've had the world communist movement, the civil rights movement, the one world movement, the freedom of the sexes movement, the free speech movement, and at peak traffic hours on our freeways and expressways, almost no movement at all. The nations of the world have tried to unite, not with total success. Dozens of new nations have emerged into the world community, some of them later wishing they hadn't. And we've had a steady parade of international crises. Berlin, Korea, Cuba, the Congo, Dominican Republic, Panama, and Vietnam. We've had the awful tragedy of a presidential assassination and the smooth transition in our government that followed. And we've experienced happiness, too, that comes from more leisure time, a full lunch pail and two cars in every garage, with a boat now and at least nine million more of them. Quite literally, it has been the most earth-shaking 40 years in the entire five billion year history of this small planet. Through it all, the National Broadcasting Company has kept America informed and entertained as the leader in a communications medium that knows no parallel in human affairs. During the past 40 years, the combined NBC radio networks have presented more than 250,000 hours of service covering virtually every facet of our day-to-day -day living. And since national television became a reality, NBC TV has provided us with more than 125,000 hours of information, education, and sheer pleasure. And that's only the beginning. Now, with television catching the public fancy in other countries, many top NBC shows, such as Bonanza, are being translated into foreign tongues and are being enjoyed by millions more around the globe. <laughs> Kanojo, 
ロリはいつも感情的だ母さんミルで似てるはいお母さんが馬から落ちたのがあんまり良くなかったでしょう Meanwhile, back at the ranch, in this affectionate salute to the National Broadcasting Company, there is no more proper place to begin than with the man whose vision, energy, enthusiasm, and most of all, understanding of the tools that have been invented, charted the course of all commercial broadcasting, and whose dedication to the development of the new medium made broadcasting what it is today. Chairman of the board of the Radio Corporation of America, founder of NBC, And the man who conceived the idea of nationwide broadcasting as a service to the American public, Brigadier General David Sarnoff. As a very young man, he achieved international fame as a brass pounder in the employ of the inventor of wireless telegraphy, Guglielmo Marconi. By 1922, he had grown up with the radio industry and was an officer in the newly organized Radio Corporation of America, which specialized in overseas and shipped ashore wireless telegraphy. At that time, there were 1,400 local stations cluttering the airwaves in the United States. But as the novelty began to wear off and listener interest dwindled sharply, the number of stations on the air dropped to 640, with many more doomed to silence. David Sarnoff had anticipated this lack of interest, and as early as 1922, had written a memorandum to the president of the General Electric Company, one of the principal owners of RCA at that time. In this memorandum, Mr. Sarnoff wrote, It seems to me that in seeking a solution to the broadcasting problem, we must recognize that the answer must be along national rather than local lines, for the problem is distinctly a national one. Therefore, let us organize a separate and distinct company to be known as the Public Service Broadcasting Company or the American Broadcasting Company or some similar name. But his suggestion was ignored, and it was not until 1926 when a shakeup in the ownership of RCA occurred. But David Sarnoff was in a position to put his plan into action. On September 9th of that year, the National Broadcasting Company was incorporated. On November 15th, 1926, NBC broadcast its first program. With WEAF New York as the flag station, the program originated in the ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria and featured Will Rogers, Mary Garden, Tito Rufo, the New York Symphony Orchestra. The Edwin Franco Goldman Band, Weber and Fields, and the dance music of Vincent Lopez, Ben Burney, B.A. Rolfe, and George Olson's orchestras. That very first network broadcast was carried on 25 stations as far west as Kansas City. And that was the beginning of NBC. The mighty Titans of Stanford threw back the charging Southerners, and now it's second down and goal to goal. Stanford is screaming for its team to hold. The very first coast to coast broadcast, for example, occurred on New Year's Day, 1927. Graham McNamee was at the microphone in Pasadena's Rose Bowl to give an exciting account of the football game between Alabama and Stanford. They battled to a 7 7 tie. President Calvin Coolidge's Washington birthday message was carried coast to coast in 1927. And on June 11th of that year, the entire country joined the nation's capital in welcoming home Charles A. Lindbergh after his historic flight to Paris. With public interest in radio booming, America's newspapers took the hint and created a brand new department as a service to their readers. And thus, in the late 20s, was born the radio editor. One of the first, and for years one of the best known, was Bernie Milligan of the Los Angeles Examiner. Today, he's a successful tire dealer in the heart of Hollywood. But from the late 20s and on through the 30s, he was a professional observer to the mushrooming miracle of radio. One of the things I remember most vividly about those days was the way radio mushroomed. Along about the time of the first Dempsey Tunney fight, very few persons had radios, but suddenly after that fight, everybody seemed to have one. Tunney shot a hard left to Dempsey's face, which he follows up with two mean left to Dempsey's face. Then he lands a right, and then Dempsey comes back, and, and now, Tunney, Tunney is down! The second Dempsey Tunney fight with the famous long count was carried on 69 NBC stations, the largest network ever organized to that time. The fight probably sold more radio sets than any other single event before or since. 
As David Sarnoff had predicted, a nationwide audience provided the economic lure that was to attract to radio the premier artists of the time. They came from the concert hall, from the operatic stage, from Broadway, from vaudeville, from Hollywood, from the night spots of the Roaring Twenties. And soon millions of Americans were to enjoy, for nothing, what only a handful had enjoyed before at considerable cost. It was the beginning of the golden age of broadcasting, and the radio loudspeaker became a cornucopia of entertainment wealth, spilling its bounty in every corner of the land. On January 18, 1928, a career was launched that was destined to become the brightest of its time, a career that stretched over the years even until today. He's a little older now and entitled to all the privileges of descent that go with 40 years of stardom. The personality of whom we speak lives in this fabled home atop the highest of the Hollywood Hills. He looks down on Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, the San Fernando Valley, Hollywood, and a number of his contemporaries. When you push the front doorbell, there's no doubt who lives here. Rudy Valley. Hi-ho, everybody. Won't you come in? I have rather mixed feelings about this salute to the National Broadcasting Company. Mixed because my association with them has been a very long one. Actually, my radio success, my little band and I, became successful in New York City in 1928 and 29 through broadcasts over three little local stations from the High Ho Club in the Villa Valley. NBC climbed aboard the bandwagon after we were rolling, we were the toast of the East. And of course, I've been with them a long time. Actually, uh, I say it should be a salute to Rudy Valley by NBC because I've made a fortune for NBC, not only because I did most of my broadcasts with them, but I let them manage me for the first two or three years of my career. And they made quite a bit of money in commissions. But uh, practically, I'll say 95% of my broadcasts from 1929 to 1947 were on the NBC network. Yes, I'll never forget when Merlin Hall Aylesworth, otherwise known as Deke Aylesworth, the president of NBC in 1929, asked me to meet him at uh, 711 Fifth Avenue, the big offices of NBC in those days. And he, he made me feel very, very happy, very flattered when he said, you have given radio a great shot on the arm when it needed it very badly because radio was beginning at that time to become monotonous and dull. It wasn't going anywhere, almost declining, as he put it. And he said, you've done a great deal for the medium and for us at NBC. We had two comedians, an excerpt from a Broadway play, some sort of a personality like a groundhog building the tunnel under the river, and all this sort of thing. It was beautifully written and became a very, very great show. And we, I think we presented everybody who was anybody from every part of the world except Jack Benny. He was too young. But we gave Burl, we gave Hope, we gave Skelton all their first opportunities to try themselves as comedians in radio, and they didn't click too importantly because they hadn't been seen yet in pictures. That is, Hope and Skelton became much more important in radio after they were seen on the screen. But uh, we had Joe Penner, who became a sensation overnight, had his own show later on, and Bergen, of course, went forth with his own show on Sunday nights. It is not my thought to use Bergen on the show. As a matter of fact, I almost lost him up. I said to him, you're going to use uh, the little country dummy, aren't you, Mortimer Snurd, because being a country boy myself, I, I felt that I'd like to see Snurd. I, I like Snurd better than I do Charlie. And he said, do you think I should? And if I'd said, yes, you must, he probably would have done it. And uh, in that particular case, he probably never been as popular because Charlie McCarthy is the alter ego in all of us who dares to say things and speak his mind the way we don't dare to want to. And of course, I left it to Bergen. I said, this is your first appearance. You use the figure you'd like to use. Then I had the seal test show with John Barrymore and Joan Davis in 1940, which was also on NBC. And Barrymore took that little show from a low summer rating of four to a high Crosby and a hoop of 26 or 27 about the time that I went to the Coast Guard as a commissioned officer and couldn't do the broadcast any longer. Miss Davis took over after Barrymore died. And of course, she was very successful with it too. So I know radio pretty well and I know the, uh, the situation. August 19th, 1929. A milestone not only in the history of NBC, but in the living habits of untold millions of Americans. For it was on that date that Charles Carell and Freeman Gosden began their series of nightly broadcasts from Chicago. You could walk down the hall of any apartment house in the country, or up any street in the land on a summer evening, and never miss a word of Amos and Andy. And remember when announcer Bill Hay used to say, and here they are. So you're going away for the weekend, Amos. Show 
sure hope you have a nice time. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, tell me, Amos, uh, who is you leaving in charge of the department? Well, I ain't figuring on having nobody here. Oh, uh, how about burglars? Yeah. Well, I went away before and I just locked the place and nothing was stolen. Oh, well, maybe the burglars didn't get around to you yet. Yeah, I guess they're shorthanded, just like everybody else. <laughs> Look here, these burglars work the thing in alphabet order. Now, you just lucky because your name is Joan. They ain't got down to you yet. Uh, and uh, is you heard where the burglars is down to now? Uh, yeah. I heard they was just finishing the letter before J, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, seems to me I hear that too. They was working on the R's. I remember that. <laughs> The star who gave us truth or consequences, and this is your life, didn't arrive on the scene for another 10 years. But because he's a master at peering into the past, we've invited him to join us on our journey into yesterday. And here he is, a longtime NBC personality, Ralph Edwards. Yes, it's true. Truth or Consequences was on NBC for 26 years. And it's still going strong over lots of stations coast to coast with Bob Barker. And This Is Your Life was on NBC for 11 years, two on radio and nine on television. We'll talk about them when they come up in their proper chronological order. Right now, let's enjoy some of those big radio shows of yesterday. With the advent of the 30s came the multi-talented Eddie Cantor, who remained one of the big stars of the air for more than 30 years. On his shows, new young stars were first introduced such as Deanna Durbin, Dinah Shore, and Eddie Fisher. There was a popular juggler in vaudeville at this time, a tall, lean, sardonic fellow who cracked jokes as he juggled. He brought his incomparable wit to radio with Town Hall Tonight. There was only one Fred Allen. Tell me, Mr. Moody, what are your feelings about the radio? I don't hold with it, Bub. Uh, displeases you? I don't hold with furniture that talks. Well, you you have a radio. No, I had one in the hen house. Yeah? One day, all the hen's nest would be empty. Uh-huh. Next day, every nest would have two eggs into it. You mean? The hens were listening to double or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> in 1932, the zany comedy of the late, great Ed Wynn brought something new to our loudspeakers. Tonight's show will absolutely make you scream. <laughs> I'd like it better if you'd laugh, too, you know. I... <laughs> Telephone probably just a minute. Hello? Who is it? My landlady? What? I'm doing a show you shouldn't bother. Did I put the cat out? I didn't even know it was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> One of the all-time great comedy shows followed a little later in 1932 when Jack Benny left Vaudeville for NBC. Oh, my goodness, look what I forgot. What? This present here under the tree. It's for Ed, the man who guards my vault. Well, Jack, that's certainly nice of you to remember him. Don, all the years that Ed has been down there, never once have I forgotten him at Christmas. Excuse me, kids, I want to go down there and give him his present. See, it's dark. Can hardly see the bridge across the moat. <laughs> oh, there it is. Hmm. The moat looks empty without the alligator. <laughs> I'll have to get another one. Mary had to have a purse for Christmas. <laughs> oh, well. password. When you say I beg your pardon, then I'll come back to you. <laughs> oh, it's you, Mr. Benny. That's right, Ed. Well, I'll light a candle so you can see the combination on the safe. Oh, no, no, Ed. I'm not down here to open the safe. You're not? 
No, no, I brought you your present. Oh, happy birthday to me, happy birthday. No, 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 Ed, no. It's, uh, it's Christmas. Christmas? How time flies. Oh, go ahead, Ed, go ahead, open your present. I will. There you are, Ed. Do you like it? Oh, just what I've always wanted. A kite. In 1935, another of the all-time great shows of radio took to the air from the NBC Central Division in Chicago. It starred Marion and Jim Jordan as Fibber McGee and Molly, and it was to become one of the most popular shows in the business for several years. Now, one of the trademarks of Fibber McGee was his closet, remember? Every time he opened it, there was an awful crash as an accumulation of junk spilled out. Well, this closet was the product of the writing talent of Don Quinn, paired with the imagination of a couple of NBC sound effects men. One of these original creators of Fibber's Closet was Tom Horan. Well, we looked him up. He's still with the NBC station in Chicago, WMAQ, and he obligingly recreated, especially for this anniversary salute, a wonderful closet of Fibber McGee in living color. You'll see it in a moment. Let's visit now with Fibber McGee and Molly. Show a little trivia my air raid warden, tell me, Molly. I wouldn't know where to look for it, dearie. Oh, you... I know where it is. It's right here in the hall closet. Oh, no, 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 no. Straighten out that closet one of these days. <laughs> now, you youngsters who feel sorry for Mom and Dad because they didn't have the Beatles and the Stones and Sonny and Cher when they were your age, just pay attention for a moment. What Mom and Dad did have was a young drummer who came to Hollywood from Gonzaga University in the state of Washington. He joined Al Rinker and Harry Barris to form the Rhythm Boys. And they sang with the marvelous orchestra of the King of Jazz, Paul Whiteman. Now, this young fellow became the most widely popular singer of all time, an international institution. His name was Bing Crosby. Come to me, my melancholy baby. Cuddle up and don't be blue. All your fears are foolish fancies, maybe. You know, dear, that I'm in love with you. Hey. Bing Crosby became an NBC star in 1936 with the popular Kraft Music Hall with Ken Carpenter, John Scott Trotter's music, and a wide variety of guest stars. It's virtually impossible to say Bing Crosby without thinking of his longtime friend of innumerable road pictures, Bob Hope. Now, Bob Hope is in a class all by himself. He's been an NBC star for 30 years. He's made 50 hit pictures. He's made countless hundreds of public appearances, most of them for no fee, simply for the benefit of American servicemen stationed in remote corners of the globe. And here he is on the set of his own show in the NBC studios in Burbank, California. Bob, how has comedy changed in the 30 years since you've been an NBC star? And why aren't there as many comedians on the air as there used to be? Comedy has matured in America right along with the growing sophistication of the public. Thirty years ago, people, and I mean the broad mass of people, didn't read their newspapers as thoroughly as they do today. Now we have, besides papers, the weekly news magazines, hourly reports on radio, and all the news and background programs on TV. So people are much more aware of what's going on in the world. So comedy can be built around more sophisticated subjects than it used to be. It hasn't been too long ago the large part of comedy was based on Jewish, Greek, Negro, Italian, and Irish dialects. Those were false pictures of the minority groups, and comedy today, to be accepted, must be built on truth. So the misfortunes of the minorities are no longer acceptable as material for jokes. That's another example of how we've matured in our thinking. Why aren't there more comedians around today? <laughs> Look, who needs more comedians? <laughs> no, actually, one reason is because there aren't as many places to learn the trade. Vaudeville, you know, gave us Jack Benny, Fred Allen, the Marx Brothers, the Burns and Allens, 
the Cantors, Burroughs, Edwins, and all the other great ones. Vaudeville was their training ground, their high school. We have no more vaudeville. So a great many comedians came from burlesque, too, and burlesque as it was in its heyday is gone. I think there are a lot of good comedians on their way up, but not in the numbers there used to be. It's a tough racket these days. In fact, I'm thinking of letting my hair grow and learning to play the guitar. Now, in just a minute, you're going to see a film of one of my old radio shows. It's about 25 years old. And you can see for yourself how the comedy has changed since this film was made. You can also see for yourself how the comedian has changed. Now I'd like you to meet a member of our troupe that has just returned from the South Pacific, a man who's been all over, a famous world traveler, Professor Kelowna, right here. Well, there he is. Say, Professor, we'd like a few words on your experience as a world traveler. That Pacific tour wasn't your first big trip, was it, Kelowna? Oh, no, I've been to England, Russia, Australia, Africa, and Alaska. You've been to England, Russia, Australia, Africa, and Alaska. Yes. I'll get one of your checks cashed yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Professor, you certainly are living proof that man is only a few steps ahead of monkey. Well, walk fast. I'll wait for you. <laughs> I don't know if I told you this or not, Hope, but I'm planning another big trip. You see, I'm going to visit the icebox, the oven, and the pantry. Icebox, oven, and pantry? What kind of a big trip is that? Cook's tour. <laughs> Good night, Chet. Good night, Bob. Good night, David. Good night, Bob. You keep out of this, Brinkley. It happens I was saying good night to David Sarno. <laughs> we will continue our salute to NBC's 40 years of service to the nation after station identification. Now let's rejoin Ralph Edwards as we continue the parade of stars and shows that made it the golden age of radio. The big radio shows continued to come thick and fast in the middle and late 30s. There was the wonderful One Man's Family created by Carlton E. Morse and Joe Penner with his familiar Want to Buy a Duck? <laughs> and of course Major Bose in his unforgettable amateur hour. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, again we bring you new faces and new talents. The amateurs of today are the stars of tomorrow, and the wheel of fortune spins. Around, around she goes, and where she stops, nobody knows. And now, the harmonica trio in their own interpretation of Nagasaki. I'll never forget one of the announcers on that show. <laughs> it was me. And Young America made a star of Kay Kaiser and his College of Musical Knowledge. Evening, folks. Hi, y'all. Well, come on, children. Yes, damn Pete. Grab yourself a bucking bronco and yes, go. I'm an old cow hand. Now, taking all this in proper sequence, let's go back to the tire store and the former Los Angeles radio editor, Bernie Milligan. This time he has someone with him. I'd like to have you meet an old friend of mine, Chet Locke. Chet is one of the pioneers of the business. Today he is known as Chester H. Locke, executive assistant to the chairman of the board of Continental Oil Company. But in those golden days of radio, Chet was a member of one of the greatest teams ever to take the air. He was Lum of Lum and Abner, who for 25 years gave us some of the finest entertainment we ever had. And with their entry into radio is quite a story. Chet, uh, suppose you'd tell us about that. Uh, thank you, Bernie, for that nice introduction. I could have stood here all day and listened to that, and I thought there for a few minutes I was going to. Uh, <laughs> you sounded like you were reading my obituary. I feel like I should have done a decent thing and died before I got here. Uh, you ask about how we started. It's a long story, Bernie, and I don't know whether we have time for it. And it goes back to 1931. I'm not sure that I can recall all the details, but my partner, Norris Goff, we called him Tuffy, and I lived in a very small town back in the hills of Arkansas. But in order to amuse ourselves and a few of our friends, uh, we started 
teaming up in a little comedy act and established a sort of a local reputation. And we were encouraged enough that we went to Chicago, had an audition before NBC, and Quaker Oats Company was looking for a new act about that time and heard about us being in town. But they wouldn't come over to the studio to hear us, so we had to go over to their offices and audition. They took the mountain to Mohammed. And in order to create the illusion, we, we did these older characters, and we were quite young in those days. Since then, I've grown into the part. And we had the officials of the Quaker Oats Company sit with their backs to us while we uh, put on a little skit and, and delivered our audition. And of course, we couldn't see their faces and didn't know what the reaction was, but it must have been favorable because they did buy the show and put us on both the red and the blue networks. And this was our start into radio. And I'm not going to tell you the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've been speaking about the top nighttime shows, but we haven't forgotten the daytime, where millions of housewives lost their troubles in the trials and tribulations of the soap opera. This is the home of Mr. and Mrs. Martin Halperin and their son, Mark, in Reseda, California. Mr. Halperin is an engineer at North American Aviation in Southern California. And he's going to tell us about his unusual hobby. You know, NBC and I are the same age. We came along at the same time and we grew up together. When I was a child, radio was my close companion. And I guess it's because it challenged my, my imagination. I used to sit in front of the loudspeaker for hours listening to radio programs of all kinds and becoming very involved in the stories that they were telling. I could, through my imagination, put myself more easily into the plot than I can today with television, where it's all there for you. And today in my garage, I have over 3,000 radio programs. They're all cataloged and indexed. And where I find that some of these programs are falling apart, I transfer them over to tape. And because radio meant so much to me, I decided that if I ever had a child, I wanted him to have the same wonderful opportunity to exercise his imagination as I did. Of course, I liked all the big nighttime shows, but in particular, I liked the daytime programs. Oh, such programs like David Harum, Just Plain Bill, Our Gal Sunday, Lorenzo Jones, Against the Storm, Guiding Light, Aunt Jenny. But my particular favorite, the one that I, I have really never forgotten, is the one about that couple that lived in the little white house halfway up on the next block, Vic and Sade. Katie. I will tell you an improving little story. Don't bother. Sadie, I will tell you an improving little story. Don't bother. I feel it my duty to tell you an improving little story. Believe I got something in my tooth. One gets each round steak, one gets something in one's tooth. The garbage man was telling me the other day his brother got something in his tooth on his wedding day. And he was so taken up with it that, you know, he didn't pay any attention to the ceremony and he never heard the preacher's question and neglected to say, I do. The garbage hmm? man's brother leads an exciting life. Well, a person, they get something in their tooth, their eyes glaze over and they're oblivious to what's going on around them, even if the roof is caving in. Mm -hmm. My Aunt Florence got something in her tooth. It was the only tooth she had. She was 89 years old. It wasn't all comedy. It was great drama and many inspiring educational and religious programs. And of course, there was great music too, in abundance. The NBC Music Appreciation Hour with Walter Damrosch, the famous Voice of Firestone concerts, the Ford Symphony, the Boston, New York, Chicago symphonies, and many more. The most remarkable musical organization ever organized, especially for radio, was the magnificent NBC Symphony Orchestra under the direction of the immortal Arturo Toscanini. Here is a rare film of the maestro at work. NBC Symphony and Arturo Toscanini. We may never hear the likes of it again. 
Well, along about this time, a young man full of high hopes and enthusiasm went to New York. He had an idea for something new in radio. His name was uh, Ralph Edwards. Ralph, forgive me for interrupting, but uh, we're going to surprise you for a change. This time, you're the guest, and I'm going to say, this is your life, Ralph Edwards. You came to New York in the middle 30s, and for 10 years, you were a top network announcer, introducing such shows as Major Bowes, along with Jimmy Wallington and Dan Seymour. And you announced Ed McHugh, the gospel singer, Life Can Be Beautiful, Against the Storm, Guiding Light, Road of Life, The O'Neills, and Vic and Sade, among many others. At one time, you announced 25 shows in one week, literally running from studio to studio to do it. Then you decided it was time you had a show of your own. Well, you created one of the biggest audience pullers ever to intrigue the public, and you launched it on NBC. It was truth or consequences. We well remember the contestants you had living in trees, uh, on top of flagpoles, in department store windows, and in one case, in a tent in the middle of Hollywood Boulevard. Ralph, you made the transition from radio to television with effortless ease. First with Truth or Consequences, then with This Is Your Life. Now, which of the latter series do you recall with the most satisfaction? Oh, I don't know. That's like asking a father which of his children he likes best. Dr. Lawrence C. Jones, the little professor of Piney Woods, Mississippi, is the memorable subject. Here are a few brief scenes from that story. The story of a dedicated teacher who started with nothing but enthusiasm and erected a school for his people. What does that say there, sir? Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence C. Jones. Who's that? There might be another one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's no one but you, sir. This is true. It is you. Dr. Lawrence C. Jones, known as the little professor of Piney Woods, Mississippi, this is your life. Doing your work. Dr. Chandler, who's, what did he say? Who's doing your work? Yeah, who is doing your work while you're on here? <laughs> Dr. Chandler, uh, you uh, had a Ph.D. degree and you were teaching college in New York. You came to Piney Woods to make a commencement address and you stayed, is that right? That's right. Uh, because I saw before me the sanest education and the true sense of values I have ever encountered. Dr. Jones, our reward has been thousands of trained farmers, uh, homemakers, teachers, office workers, skilled trades workers who have raised the standard of living in all parts of Mississippi and in every part of the nation. From this one single episode of This Is Your Life, dealing with his story, the generous people of America contributed over a million dollars to ensure that his wonderful school would continue to educate the young people of that remote area long after the little professor was gone. Thank you, Ralph Edwards. I understand you're cooking up some new shows for us, so good luck with them. I know there'll be something new and different. No, I'll talk to you later about that. See you later, folks. Goodbye. Time marches on. This is the famous Brown Derby restaurant in Hollywood. Here's Art Linkletter and his partner and producer, John Goodell. Art and John were sitting at this same table 26 years ago. Let's get the story from Art himself. Seems impossible, doesn't it, that two young fellows like John and myself could have been sitting right in this booth 26 years ago discussing people are funny, but it happened that way. I came down from San Francisco. I was a young master of ceremonies and writer up there, and I had an idea for a show based on psychology with a professor from Stanford University, and I was going to call it Meet Yourself. And a friend of ours said that uh, John had a similar idea, and... Uh, your professor was from uh, uh, USC. And the title of your show was People Are Funny. And uh, Bruce Ells, a mutual friend of ours, was a time salesman, and he had been through the lobby of the Sir Francis Drake Hotel in San Francisco, and he said, you know, there's a fellow that's got a program interviewing people up there named Art Linkletter, and you ought to meet him. And he arranged for us to have this lunch at the Derby, and here both of us had almost identical ideas. We uh, put $35 into the audition record. Thirty dollars. Well, I had five dollar taxi cab. Oh, I'm I sorry. never charged you for that. Well, I owe you two fifty. Now, we made an audition record and we sent it to Chicago and two weeks later, People Are Funny was on the air and it stayed on the air for 21 years. 
Here's one of our favorite people are funny stunts on film. Ladies and gentlemen, People Are Funny is happy to announce now the biggest, quickest, simplest giveaway in the history of TV quiz shows. I'm holding a check in my hand for $128,000. Twice as much as you know what program gives away. <laughs> and we're going to show you how quickly it's done. Pat McGee, will you bring the hats down, the two hats? This gentleman right here in the second row, would you pick a, a, a slip out of that hat? A number of slips in there, what does it say? Row seven center. Row seven center. Will you pick a number, another slip out of those numbers? What does it say? Seat two. Seat two, row seven center, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seat two. This lady right here. Listen, madam, for $128,000, for 22 years, I have been on television and radio, and that time I've been called a lot of names, mostly Art Linkletter. For $128,000, what is my middle name? Gordon. That is right. Gordon, Link, Arthur Gordon Linkletter. And what is, what is your name? Your mother. Just by chance, you picked my mother. Ah, uh, I knew I'd seen your face around before. That's my sweet little 87-year-old mother who's visiting me. Uh, you are a relative of an employee on this program, and so you cannot get any money. However, I am all for you, so I want you to have this ticket to strike it rich. <laughs> Goodbye. We had a lot of fun proving that people are funny, and as a matter of fact, uh, John Goodell here was the papa of another show called You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx. It actually grew out of a people are funny stunt because we went over to do a people are funny guest spot on a big hour variety show which was being taped and Groucho Marx was one of the other guests and he had nothing to do with us but you watched him in rehearsal and you watched him on the final show and you noticed that he was doing a lot of ad-libbing. Well, Bob Hope dropped his script and so Bo uh, Groucho dropped his script and those fellows were a lot funnier after they dropped their script than they were when they were reading them. And so I figured, well, if uh, Groucho's so much funnier without a script, maybe he should try a show with uh, real people uh, like, well, uh, old maids and taxi drivers and truck drivers rather than other sophisticated comedians. <laughs> Mr. Ramiro G. Gonzalez, eh? That's you? Si, sí, senor. That's me. Si, sí, si, sí, senor. <laughs> Ramiro G. Gonzalez. <laughs> what does the uh, G stand for, Ramiro? Huh? Gonzalez? <laughs> no, I know. Ramiro Gonzalez, but it says Ramiro G. Gonzalez. What oh? does the G stand for? Ramiro Gonzalez Gonzalez. <laughs> What are you, twins? No. Are you pinch heading for your father? No, uh, I'm Gonzalez, Ramiro Gonzalez Gonzalez, because my father, before she married my mother, she, she was Gonzalez. Give me that once more. Uh... My father was Gonzalez before he married my mother, and my mother was Gonzalez before she married my father. Well, they were crazy to get married. <laughs> what does your wife call you, Romero or Gonzalez? Uh, she called me Pedro. <laughs> uh. This is Groucho's lovely home on a hillside overlooking Beverly Hills. Let's visit with Mrs. Marx and the one, the only, Groucho. You've been on radio for 15 years and on television for over 10 years. Now, which medium do you prefer? Uh, how does television compare with all the other mediums that you've been in? 
Well, it's, hard, it's really hard to compare them because uh, there are different times in my life when I was in these various uh, forms of uh, entertainment. The, uh, when I was on the stage, I, of course, I was much younger than when I was in television, but you, and you play to a different audience. Say you play to an audience that can afford to spend three or four dollars for a seat. Those seats now, the equivalent of those seats, are eight or ten dollars. But in those days, it was around four dollars. So you got to play to a very select audience. You could only play to around twelve, fourteen hundred people a night in the theater, which meant that in a week, you might play to um, ten thousand people or fifteen thousand people. Whereas in television today. You play to, if they like the show that you're doing, you can play to 30, 40 million people. You could be on the stage for your whole life and you could never equal the number of people that you play to in one night on television. That's the difference. But in television, you're in the bedroom or you're in the living room. And you, they can have their shoes off or in their pajamas or anything else. But you're right close to them there. And you feel, they feel that you're one of them, really. And you're playing to all of America, you're playing to 40 and 50 million people in a night. And you're playing to people in, in hospitals and in veterans hospitals. And, and you're playing to uh, old, old homes where people are incapacitated and many of them in wheelchairs or in bed that they'll never get out of. And this comes in there. And you, sometimes you think of that when, when you're doing the show or before or after. And what a wonderful, what a godsend this must be to these people to get this entertainment for nothing. Groucho's show, You Bet Your Life, was a top NBC attraction for 13 years on radio and television. And it won virtually every major award, including the Peabody Award and the Emmy. Here's an early television tube used in the very first days in 1928. The picture appeared on that little grid in the middle of the tube. It was about an inch and a half square. You looked at it through a series of small holes punched in a revolving disc. The television set of 1928 looked like this. You saw your program through that small hole near the top. General Sarnoff launched NBC television at the New York World's Fair in 1939. President Roosevelt was televised as the first chief executive ever to be seen on the air. WNBT, now WNBC, began commercial operation in July of 1941. But there was a war on, and American skilled labor and vital materials needed for the manufacture of television receivers were more urgently needed in the prosecution of the war. Television for the general public just had to wait. The signal that ended World War II was the starting signal for TV, and it began to boom in the late 1940s. One of the first big stars to be created by television was a national institution in a few short months. He was the king, and none could quarrel with his title, Mr. Television, Milton Berle. All right, Milton, I need Let's get the robe off you. Hey, what happened to you in there? Well, I, I was, I was a dude. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh, you still got your mouthpiece there. Let's get your mouthpiece on. Yeah. <laughs> NBC, pioneer in radio, pioneer in television, added still another dimension in August 1953. A new and certainly the most colorful star of all was born, or should I say, hatched. It was the NBC Peacock. Color TV had arrived. Today, millions of us enjoy not only sight and sound, but exciting pictures in living color. Now, so far in this salute to NBC, we've emphasized the entertainment highlights of radio and television. But when David Sarnoff and the other founders of the network formulated their policies, equally, if not even of greater potential, the challenge of electronic journalism. This is Reverend Peter O'Sullivan, pastor of St. John Baptist de La Salle Catholic Church of Granada Hills, California. 
Well, I came to this country in 1934 from Ireland. And at that time, I was a very immature, naive young man. I didn't know very much about the conditions of this country and the way of life of this country. And so through radio, I, I learned a great deal. Now, these have been terribly exciting years in America. You know, a minister of God must be very well acquainted with what's going on, both locally, nationally, and worldwide. And this television set has been my window to the world. It gives me a front seat to all the principal events and all the incidents happening around the world. And when Brinkley says good night to uh, Huntley each evening, I can stand up and say good night to both of them. Television, says Father O'Sullivan, is his window to the world, and so it is to countless millions. In these most meaningful times in all of recorded history, the radio speaker and the television tube have given us each a ringside seat for history in the making. Electronic journalism has learned to use its fascinating tools of immediacy in a sort of practice period up until about 1933. It all seemed to start with the inauguration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which was broadcast to the world. Hey, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. That same year, 1933, saw an obscure ex-army corporal, ex-house painter, become Chancellor of Germany, and America became aware of Adolf Hitler. The National Broadcasting Company is bringing you this address by Adolf Hitler from Berlin, Germany. December 7th, 1941. A day, said the president, that will live in infamy. Radio listeners could scarcely believe their ears as the nation's loudspeakers told the awful tale of surprise attack. Here is what has happened. President Roosevelt phoned Secretary Early half an hour ago that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, the United States naval base on Oahu Island, in the Hawaiian Islands. This means that war is underway between Japan and the United States. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. From the moment Germany attacked Poland in 1939, NBC correspondents brought us the news from every allied capital while throughout the war, NBC combat reporters brought us thousands of word pictures of the actual fighting. The wire recorder permitted them to crawl into the foxholes with the infantry, into the cockpits of fighters and bombers in the air, and in submarines under and battleships on the surface of the sea. August 6th, 1945, a most momentous day in history. The peoples of the world learned in a shocking inferno of heat and horror the power of the atom. Hiroshima was reduced to rubble in an instant. All thinking people everywhere were stunned at the display of raw, awesome power that accompanied the birth of the atomic age. And on September 1st, 1945, NBC reporter Merrill Muller broadcast from the deck of the battleship Missouri anchored in Tokyo Bay. The most costly, terrible war of them all was finally over. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. The United Nations, from birth pangs through the embarrassments of adolescence and to the involvements of maturity today, 
has been faithfully and regularly observed and reported by the permanent NBC staff assigned to that body. For a total coverage of 71 hours, NBC shared with 200 million others here and hundreds of millions around the world the shock and grief of a presidential assassination. And those of us at NBC wept with the nation at the sadness of the funeral of John F. Kennedy. The spirit of man is indomitable. From the spaceport named after the fallen president, we have sent men into the unknown. NBC has covered in depth, both in background material and briefing programs, as well as in full coverage of the flights themselves, all major efforts of the United States in our national goal of conquering space and placing, for reasons of knowledge and exploration beyond our present comprehension, a man or men on the moon and beyond. In the not-too-distant future, you can be sure the majority of those listening to me now will hear and see a man in a spacesuit saying, this is your NBC correspondent on the moon. There is some doubt, in this quarter at least, that his name will be Chet Huntley. The future holds exciting promises and grave problems. The promises may be fulfilled and the problems solved only by means of the total communications between individuals and between nations. In the RCA and NBC research laboratories today, keen minds are dreaming and designing and building great tools of communications for tomorrow. For a future that will find, for example, our children able to communicate instantly with anyone, anywhere, at any time, by voice, sight, or the written word. Vest pocket transmitter receivers will enable the bearer to see and speak by radio, by satellite, and by wire, with anyone, anywhere in the world, similarly equipped with the vest pocket transmitter receiver. In this near future, the ultimate effect of instant, total, global communications will be the transformation and unification of all techniques for the exchange of ideas and information, of culture, of learning, and of diplomacy. It will not only generate new knowledge, but it will provide the means for its worldwide dissemination and with increasingly efficient means of televising the events of major significance around the world, such as the communication satellites, NBC will continue its policy of providing a service to the nation, a service of in-depth background programs concerning the awesome problems that confront us all, of news as it happens, no matter where on earth it is happening, as well as a balanced schedule of culture and knowledge and entertainment. Truly, in this immediate future, Father O'Sullivan's television set will become, in fact, his window to the world. We salute the National Broadcasting Company for its achievements of the past 40 years and for its dedication to service to the nation in the future. And networks.